Hello, and welcome back to Myth 201. This is Dr. Ben, and for this discussion, we're going to be looking at three Olympian children of Zeus and or Hera, namely Athena, Ares, and Hephaestus. As we saw in my lecture on Zeus and Hera, each of these represent a different kind of birth. Athena, who is born from Zeus's head after he swallows her mother. Ares, who is the product of the heroes Gamos of Zeus and Hera. And Hephaestus, who is Hera's attempt to produce a child all by her own, all, all on her own, just as Zeus did with Hera. We begin with Pallas Athena, or just Athena, whose Roman name is Minerva. Athena, as I'm sure many of you know, is the goddess of wisdom, or Glaucopis. But she is also the goddess of war, but a different kind of war than Ares. Athena is the goddess of strategic warfare, which really elevates her in status. And I would even go so far as to say makes her more important than Ares as far as warfare goes. Athena is also a goddess of women's household art, i.e. the loom, which draws a stark comparison to her with her other roles. Athena, in many ways, represents reason and its control over something more unrestrained. Where Ares is the god of unrestrained violence, Athena rules over the strategic and controlled tactics. Hermes, as we will see later, tends to the flocks, but Athena spins the wool from which clothes are made. And as we will see later in the semester, it is Athena who oversees the trial that moves the world from a world of vengeance into one of law. Suffice to say, Athena is awesome. It is no wonder the Athenians chose her as their patron. As I said before, Athena is the daughter of Zeus alone, but that is somewhat oversimplifying it. The full story, as related by Hesiod, is that Zeus is given a prophecy that he would have a son with Metis, whose wisdom, who would overthrow him. So this idea of the new generation overthrowing the older. To prevent this, Zeus takes a page out of his father's book only rather than swallowing the, children, the child after it was born, he swallows the pregnant Metis. Then one day, Zeus gets a terrible headache. He calls Hephaestus to hit him on the head, which he does, whack. Homeric Hymn 28 recounts what happens next. Quote, All the immortals watched in awe as before Zeus the goat rider, she sprang quickly down from his immortal head with a brandish of her sharp javelin. A fearsome tremor went through great Olympus from the power of the steely-eyed one. The earth resounded terribly round about and the sea heaved up in confusion of swirling waves. But suddenly the main was held in check and Hyperion's splendid son halted his swift-footed steeds for a long time. until the maiden Palestina took off like the godlike armor, took off the godlike armor with her immortal shoulders and wise Zeus rejoiced. So Athena is born fully grown and clad in armor. Here we can see the Homeric hymn being represented on the east pediment of the Parthenon, a model of which is seen here. We see the astonishment of the figures in the, at the center of the pediment, Zeus, Hera, and Hephaestus, and the reverberation of that shock. Until at the end, we see Dionysus, on the left, just drinking away, and on the right, Demeter and Persephone. Well, the very ends are Helios here and Semele driving their chariots, but these are more about the passage of time. 
Next, we will discuss Athena's chief characteristics and representations. Athena is probably the easiest to identify. And while I feel like I've said that before, this time I actually mean it because her iconography literally defines iconic. Athena is always seen with a war helmet, shield, spear, and her most recognizable piece of armor, her aegis, which is a breastplate with the head of Medusa firmly affixed to it. Her bird, the owl. She is also sometimes shown holding Zeus's thunder and lightning bolts. She is said to have been the only one other, only the only other with the keys to Zeus's battery of weapons. And she is the only other who wields these iconic weapons. So why is Medusa so closely associated with Athena? Ovid, a later Roman author, recounts how Medusa is turned from a beautiful woman into the terrible Gorgon whose gaze turns men into stone. He recounts, she was once most beautiful in form and the jealous hope of many suitors. Of all her beauties, her hair was the most beautiful. For so I learned from one who said he had seen her. She said that in Minerva's temple, Neptune, Poseidon, Lord of the ocean, ravished her. Joe's daughter turned away and hid her chaste eyes behind her aegis. So Poseidon sees how, sees how beautiful Medusa is, and like his younger brother Zeus, refuses to control his urges. Athena, who shies away from such things, hides her eyes. But Ovid doesn't stop there. And that the deed might be punished as was due, she changed Gorgon's locks to ugly snakes. Or now to frighten her fear-numbered foes, she still wears upon her breast the snakes which she has made. Athena, much like Hera, does to the women, just much like Hera does to the women who sleeps with, punishes not the god, but the woman. This is not the only run-in that Athena has with Poseidon. Athena is the patron goddess of Athens, and the city even bears her name. But there's actually a competition between Athena and Poseidon for the patronage of this prestigious city of Greece. The people decide that each god would need to offer a gift or prize to the city to win its patronage. Poseidon offers a saltwater spring, Athena an olive tree. The olive tree is chosen and Athena wins the day. We're also told that the people of Athens were autochthonous, which means born from the earth. And in this case, born from Athena and Hephaestus. Now you might be asking yourself, self, wasn't Athena a virgin goddess? Yes, yes she was. And the story goes something like this. One day, Athena is receiving a delivery of weapons from Hephaestus, who, overcome with desire, can't control himself and chases after her. She runs from him, but Hephaestus, and Hephaestus is aroused as he's chasing her and gets so excited that he ejaculates on Athena's thigh. Disgusted, she wipes um, it off onto the ground. And from her sweat mixed with Hephaestus' semen, Erechthonius is born. Athena places him in a box and gives the box to Kekrops' three daughters, Kekrops, who is the king of Athens, telling them to never look inside. Two of them do and go insane after seeing Erechthonius, as he was half man and half snake. He would eventually overthrow the king of Athens and rule as the fifth king. Next, we take a look here at the Athenian Acropolis. This is the highest point of the city, surrounded by sheer cliffs. And it works as a and it works as a large temple or building complex for the Athenians. This also represents the end point of a festival called the Panathenaea. 
this festival was celebrated every year, although eventually it was every four years, and consisted of sacrifices and different rites to the cult of Athena that are mostly unknown. And we'll actually see later that many of sort of these cult activities are unknown to us um, and only a few, in fact, only one of these rites are known to us. What we do know is that there was a procession through the city concluding with a presentation of a newly embroidered peplos or dress to the statue of Athena here on the Acropolis. Part of this festival and procession would go by the Erechtheion found on the Acropolis. Right here. Here is what remains of the Erechtheion today. This building contains many emblems of Athena and faced the altar of Athena on the Acropolis. Herodotus in his history tells us that on that Acropolis there's a shrine of Erechtheus the Earthborn as he is called, wherein is an olive tree and a salt pool, which as the Athenians say, were set there by Poseidon and Athena as tokens of their contention for the land. Now it was so that the olive tree was burnt with the temple by the foreigners, these are the Persians. But on the day after its burning, when the Athenians bid it by the king to sacrifice, went up to the temple, they saw a shoot of about a cubit's length spring from the trunk, which thing they reported. Here we actually can sort of see an artist's rendering of what this building might have looked like in its heyday. Also on the Acropolis is the Parthenon, which I'm gonna guess is probably the no most well-known building on the Acropolis and probably the one with which you are most familiar. This building was built during Athens' golden age, the fifth century BC, from the monies taken from the Delian League. And at Sella, or back room basically, contained the League's treasury. This building, and now it's up for debate, may or may not have meant to serve as a temple of Athena. And although it did house a large statue of the goddess, it appears to be much more of a treasury than a religious building although that doesn't really prevent it from being used as a temple. It really is a, just a beautiful, beautiful building, even in the state it's in now. Next, we have the Elgin Marbles. This is the name given to the marbles of the east and west pediment of the Parthenon, along with many of the metopes, an art history term you don't need to know, depicting the battle of the Lapis and the Centaurs. These marbles, taken from Greece in the early 19th century, are now housed in the British Museum in London. There's still to this day debate about the legality of them being in the UK. Greece even has a museum with spots waiting for them to be returned, however unlikely that is. This photo is of the East Pediment, which is what remains of the scene showing the birth of Athena. Next, we looked at this, look at this reconstruction of the statue of Athena as it might have looked. The statue is a reconstruction of the Parthenon, 
is found in a reconstruction of the Parthenon in Nashville, Tennessee, near Vanderbilt's campus. Now, take a look at the statue as I sort of read how Pausanias described the statue. The statue itself is made of ivory and gold. In the middle of her helmet is placed a likeness of the Sphinx. The statue of Athena is upright with a tunic reaching to the feet and on her breast, the head of Medusa is worked in ivory. She holds a statue of victory about four cubits high. On the other hand, a spear at her feet, a shield, and near the spear is a serpent. The serpent would be Erichthonius. On the pedestal is the birth of Pandora in relief. Hesiod and others have sung how this Pandora was the first woman. Before Pandora was born, there was yet no womankind. Here we have the outside. With a few more angles of the statue. If you ever get a chance, I highly recommend you go visit this statue. Highly recommend it. Here also we have some Athenian coins bearing the likeness of Athena on the obverse side with her owl on the reverse. So lastly for Athena, we come to the story of Arachne. Arachne, who brags about being better than Athena at weaving. So Athena comes down and challenges her to a weaving contest. Athena makes a beautiful tapestry showing her conquest over Poseidon for Athens patronage and several mortals who challenge the gods in contests, all surrounded by olive branches. When it is Arachne's turn, she weaves a tapestry showing the depiction of se and sexual conquests of the gods, so showing the gods' shame, surrounding the entire tapestry with ivory. At the sight of this, Athena gets angry and destroys the tapestry and Arachne is turned into a spider. In many ways, in many ways, this is really meant to show how, well, to be an example of hubris, an example of hubris, Athena is showing hubris on her tapestry, the mortals challenging gods. On the other hand, Arachne is showing the sort of shame of the gods. Ultimately, the only one who could possibly win is Athena. She's the goddess here. But Arachne, it was, we're told that Arachne's tapestry is more beautiful than Athena's. And the only reason Athena wins is because she destroys Arachne's tapestry. And then the punishment comes later. So next we have Ares whose Roman name is Mars. And I should say in many ways, he finds far more importance to the Romans, which of course is not to say that he isn't important to the Greeks. And Ares 
in Roman myth, it's he who sleeps with Rhea Silva, who later gives birth to Romulus and Remus. So Rome's very foundation is through Ares. In fact, the Romans assemble their armies on the campus Martius, um, which is just north of the city of Rome before going to warfare. As I've mentioned several times, Ares is the god of bloodlust and tactless war. He's the son of Zeus and Hera, and he fathers several deities with Aphrodite, including Eros, who's Cupid, Phobos, Terror, and Demos, Fear, the latter two who often follow him into battle. We see Ares fighting in the Iliad, where he is wounded by Diomedes while defending Aphrodite. We do have a Homeric hymn number eight to Ares, which says, Ares haughty in spirit, heavy on chariot, golden hemmed, grim hearted, shield bearer, city savior, bronze armored, tough of arm, untriding spear strong, bulwark of Olympus, father of victory in the good fight, ally of law, oppressor of the rebellious, leader of the righteous, scepter king of manliness, as you wheel your fierce circle among the seven courses light of the ether, with your, your feminine steeds ever keep you on the third orbit. Hearken, helper of mankind, giver of brave young manhood, and gleam down your kindly flare from on high into my life. And martial strength, so that I might chase bitter wickedness away from my head, deflect the soul-deceiving impulse of my thoughts, and restrain the sharp force and appetite that provokes me to embark on chill conflict. Blessed would one, grant me courage to abide by the innocuous principles of peace, escaping battle with my enemies and the perils of violence. Con contrary to sort of, we have, although we have this Homeric hymn, it really is, he's not really worshiped on the same scale by the Greeks as the Romans. And although this is true, we do still have the Areopagus or Hill of Ares, which was the place where the ancient council was held. This council consisted of the aristocracy and the ex archons for the annually elected journals of the city. And they would assemble here to vote on certain judicial matters, specifically homicide, wounding, and arson. It's later on this site that Athena will rule in favor of Orestes and put to bed the idea of vengeance for crime, bringing order to law, something that I mentioned earlier with Athena. And it's on this spot that that takes place. So once again, that association between Athena and Ares, where Athena essentially creates the civilized version of what Ares brings. So lastly, we come to Hephaestus. His Roman name is Vulcan. And in most versions of the myth, he is the son of Hera alone. But in other variants, Zeus is his father. We're just going to accept the latter variant or the former variant.
where Zeus is, where Zeus is not his father. He's the god of fire and smithing, and he works in Mount Etna with the Cyclopes, Brontus, Stereopes, and Arges. As I've said before, he's often depicted with a limp and or a lame leg. And in this representation, we can actually see this lame leg, which is often part of many of his depictions. We also often see him riding a donkey. He, of course, is married to Aphrodite, as we saw in the Aphrodite lecture. As we saw there also, she is often unfaithful to him. In the Iliad, we find out that Hephaestus actually stands up for his mother when Zeus is mistreating her. And for that, he paid for it. So although Hephaestus is lame or has this limp, this doesn't mean that he isn't very strong and very powerful. In many ways, he sort of bridges the gap between the Titans and the Olympians. He harnesses the chaotic power of fire, of lava, of the heat of the earth to create amazing things. As we'll see here in a few minutes. And here we see that his bravery or that he is also quite brave. Bear up mother and endure all of your grief. Less dear as you are, me, you are to me, I see you being beaten before my eyes. And then I shall in no way be able to help you for all my sorrow. For a hard foe is the Olympian to meet in strife. For another time before this, when I was eager to save you, he caught me by the foot and hurled me from the heavenly threshold. The whole day long I was born headlong, and at sunset I fell in Limnos, but little life was left to me. There the sentient people promptly took care of me after my fall. Here we have the temple of Hephaestus in Athens, which is actually one of the most well-preserved Greek temples in all of Greece. So once again, we see that multiple deities would have temples in cities. And so although Athens is patron is Athena, there are cities or there are temples to most of the deities of the, of the pantheon um, in the city of Athens. So one of the primary things we see Hephaestus doing inside of epic or literature is constructing armor for heroes. So here in the Iliad, we see that he made the armor for Achilles after Hector ripped his, ripped his armor off of the body of Patroclus. And I'm not gonna read these here. Again, He's asked to make armor for the Trojan hero Aeneas in Virgil's Aeneid. And in many ways, these passages parallel one another, the armor being very similar, the shields being very similar.
And so we have Hephaestus the smith god who becomes important to mortals. And in some ways he's connected with Prometheus who we'll see later. All right. So with that, I'm going to conclude. I'm not sure that there is necessity for much summary here, but what I do want you to sort of take from this is that while we have these very powerful gods and goddesses, the purpose of them is to bring order to things. Even with Ares, there's a certain order that he brings. Hephaestus, like I said, tames these elements of chaos. Athena brings civilization where civilization is not there before. Even Ares sort of helps progress civilization. And we'll see that more continuously as we talk more about the gods and even as we go into these hero myths, we'll see how the gods help how they help the, these mortals overcome the things, these primordial or powerful earthly beings and obstacles. So with that I'm gonna conclude um, as always, please don't hesitate um, to contact me if you have any questions. And until next time, I will catch you later.